Corticosteroids have been the cornerstone of asthma therapy for over 50 years. And this is because they reduce asthma deaths and they improve asthma control. But like people, well, drugs also can be good and bad. And with corticosteroids, we're constantly reviewing the balance between their benefits versus their risks. It's clear that oral corticosteroids are extremely uh, powerful anti-inflammatory drugs. We know now more or less how it works and we know that it's really efficient to decrease the release of most of the inflammatory cytokines involved into asthma. We've known for a very long time that there are a series of side effects from those therapies and for this reason there was great excitement with the introduction of inhaled corticosteroids in the 1970s and they are now the treatments of choice that we give for most of our patients with asthma. But in people with severe asthma, where they need high dose inhaled corticosteroids together with oral corticosteroids for attacks or even sometimes as maintenance treatment, it comes at a price. I started to suffer, I was diagnosed with asthma when I was 22. I was just prescribed a Ventolin inhaler, but after a period of time, those inhalers uh, would wear off so they weren't actually doing the job that's when they started me on the steroids. So I was taking eight steroids a day for a period of time, probably 10 days, and then they would, that's a short, sharp burst of uh, prednisolone. And then the asthma would be, it would be okay for a while, and then probably a few months later, the same thing would happen again, so I'd end up taking more steroids. In my clinic, most patients are referred because the management of their asthma by their GP, but most frequently by their uh, pulmonologist or allergologist, is failing somewhere. They, they don't find that the, the, the current management is satisfactory. And what is the main complaint? It's, for most of them, side effects of steroids. And we know that corticosteroids given as maintenance therapy, or even, as, even for those patients who have attacks, there's an increased risk of osteoporosis, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, cataracts, skin thinning. And these effects are cumulative, so they're in response to the dose and the duration of the dose. I went for a checkup at the opticians, and that's when the optician picked up that I'd got cataracts. But it never occurred to me that the cataracts were connected to the steroids. I'd get really bad indigestion. It's like an inflammation of the esophagus. So one morning I actually had uh, symptoms of like a heart attack. I had like really bad um, pain in my chest and I ended up in hospital here. So when we think about the adverse consequences of OCS, we have to really look at real world evidence to understand that because we need decent numbers, enough exposure. Some of the early research that we and others did looked at people with severe asthma who were getting four or more courses of steroids a year. What we've done since, this is a, and this is the largest study of its kind in this space, was to combine two large UK databases, the Optimum Patient Care Research Database and the Clinical Practice Research Database. And that enabled us to look at effectively um, about 12 million lives and maybe even more. And we were able to look at patients who've never had steroids in that database before. We had a median follow-up of about 15 years, so it enabled us to look at long periods of time. So the first thing we did was to look at those who got steroids versus those that didn't. And this is people who had at least two courses. And what we showed was an increased risk of everything you could think of. Um, osteoporosis, diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, cardiovascular, cerebrovascular disease, even renal failure. And so, we've, so we then wanted to really understand how much did it take to do that? So we looked at a dose response in terms of the number of courses of steroids, or the cumulative amount of steroids and the development of these conditions. And what we see is from the most sensitive conditions to, to, to change, and that's osteoporosis and diabetes. Once you hit a gram, just one gram of prednisolone, which is four courses on average, you see an increased risk. Some of the other conditions, which require longer to develop that, it may, it may take bigger amounts, but four courses, which is very, very little, when many patients might have a couple of courses a year. 
A number of years ago, there was interest in trying to reduce the need for oral corticosteroids with immunosuppressant agents such as methotrexate and cyclosporine. However, they've been very disappointing. The additional benefit is very small, and they themselves come with significant side effects, such that the severe asthma guidelines from the ERS and ATS do not recommend the use of methotrexate and cyclosporine in patients with severe asthma. Of course, we don't want to give the wrong message to patients. You know, steroids save lives, absolutely without question. Somebody's really sick, there's no debate they need steroids. You know, it's going to stop them dying. So we've got to be very careful with our messaging here. You know, it's important that we get alternatives into place and strategies into place to minimise our use of rescue steroids and our long-term maintenance steroids. My ambition is to find a consensus through uh, multiple experts from different uh, horizons, different landscape, that can be uh, providing their expertise um, for managing better oral corticosteroids. So we involve more than 130 experts, endocrinologists, rheumatologists, patients, pulmonologists, allergologists, etc. And they've been invited to participate into a survey where they propose statements for tapering oral corticosteroids. Um, it should be uh, performed after doing a synactin test, for example. And we have like this listed more than 1,400 statements. And after that, we ranked them within, within chapters and we now use the Delphi method to find consensus to provide this kind of guidelines or, or not real guidelines, but consensual statements on this. I mean, recognizing, I think, that OCS is still going to be life-saving. We need to think a bit like how I, many people start to term, use the term anti, OCS stewardship, a bit like we say antibiotic stewardship. So taking care about thinking about the appropriate use. So is that about changing their maintenance therapy, looking at adherence? Is that about increasing background treatments? Is it about using as needed combination type therapies which we're starting to see in the guidelines? And I think in the past, we've seen it as a bit of a failure for GPs to refer patients with asthma to specialists. We need to see it the completely opposite way around because actually we have a lot we can do now there are now new treatments. There are new biological treatments and there may be the possibility of other small molecule therapies coming in the future that give us a new opportunity. They give us a way of then starting patients on those treatments and then removing the burden of corticosteroids in those that are taking prednisolone and also dramatically reducing the number of attacks so that we're reducing the, the burden of the number of times we give courses of prednisolone in a year. I was asked to come for to the research centre here for tests. So I would come every four weeks and sometimes be here for three or four hours and they'd conduct several tests. In that time, they reduced the steroids. So I was having two steroids a day. So then they reduced it to one and three quarters and slowly weaned me off the steroids. And now I come every four weeks and have an injection. All new drugs come at a price, and this, is, this reflects the R&D cost of developing the drug. It also can reflect the manufacturing cost, such as with biological therapies. There's also additional burden on the healthcare provider as a new service needs to be set up. And in the case of biological therapies, if they're injected at the hospital, then there needs to be a new clinic and a new service to provide that. I would suggest that's a, a small price in comparison to the burden of the disease. And we really need to be thinking about how we can introduce these therapies into the clinic. And the big challenge, of course, is going to be is biologics are you know, relatively expensive. We can't just dish them out like Smarties. And obviously they will overcome adherence problems that we might have, but it's a very expensive way to solve adherence. So we do need to think, as we get data on earlier intervention, prices have got to come down to match that so that it actually becomes appropriate for long-term management. We know that it's cost-effective because the side effects, and especially the management of side effects of oral corticosteroids, will largely overtake the price of these drugs. I feel a lot better. I do notice that after about three weeks, when it's due for the next injection, 
I get a little bit wheezy and I can feel that the time's ready for the next injection. I have the next injection and then the next week I'm a little bit wheezy and then I'm okay for about three weeks. So my quality of life's a lot better and the quality of life's better because I'm not taking steroids. We should no longer be considering maintenance corticosteroids as part of asthma management. We should be moving towards a time where regular prednisolone is in the past. In terms of the number of times we give prednisolone for attacks, it should also reduce to a point where hopefully this can be a rare event. We then need to reconsider about where our, our ambition really lies with severe asthma. Could we actually change the disease course? Could we start to get people into remission? Could we really be contemplating cure? I think with these emerging therapies, this is something that we need to test. And it's a possibility that we could certainly work towards. Music